Okay. Questions, thoughts from the blind man, blind beggar, and Jesus. You got a mic, Matt? Simeon's got it. He's ahead of you. Okay. Now we just need someone with a question. Oh, Deb. Okay. Um, I was just thinking when we were, um, when you were talking towards the end about uh, the crowd, um, you know, not liking it when he said son of David. Yeah. I thought that they were trying to keep it quiet so that Jesus wouldn't get locked up. And or killed on his way to Jerusalem because they were afraid of of all that, um, you know. They didn't even want him to go to Jerusalem. That kind of stuff. His closest disciples did not, but Luke specifies the people who told the beggar to shut up were at the front of the crowd, which probably aren't Jesus in the circle. Jesus would be in the center of the crowd, and presumably his disciples and the twelve would be in that inner circle. So Luke says those at the front. So these are not disciples, not the twelve. Certainly, these are crowd members, and they're the they're. And I'm, and that my thought of getting to Jerusalem quickly is, if you're at the front of the crowd, it's probably because you want to get to Jerusalem. I mean, it's just an inference. Um, so no, um, the disciples certainly were trying to. If you go to Jerusalem, you get lynched or you get killed. That's not. I don't think that's what's going on here. That's not what Luke's emphasizing. Um, it's a good no, good question. But I think where Luke points this to. Um, that's not the case here, at least. Dan Burr. As the microphone makes its way, a dozen people say, thank you, Simeon. We could use another mic bearer. Yes, it is. Adam, can you prepare another mic? Yes, you can. Any ideas why Luke... Just had one blind man, and Matthew and Mark had two? I thought someone would ask that. Well, that's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that Luke has him approaching Jericho, and, Ma and Matthew and Mark have him leaving Jericho. Um, the, the, the one blind guy versus two isn't a big issue, simply because I think Luke simply wants to focus on him. He doesn't say there's only one guy. I think it's part of the reason he draws... If you were to ask me, I guess, why does he not report the guy's name? I mean, Mark says it's Bartimaeus, son of... Ptolemy, I think. Like, this guy's clearly known at the time of Mark's writing, and Luke's done his research. So why not include the name? Why not include the other guy? I think, and this, what I was trying to show here, that Luke really wants to crystallize and bring to a head a number of his themes that's been, that have been running through chapter 18, and that's done more by making him nameless. If you want to emphasize humility, lowness, childlike dependence, not focusing on the guy's name helps do that. This, this, the contrast between the rich ruler and this guy is more stark when it's one-on-one -on -one as opposed to two-on-one. -on -one. So I think Luke is trying to, in some sense, make an object lesson of this guy as it's fitting in chapter 18, and that's done better by just talking about the one guy, not giving his name. Now, as regards to approaching Jerusalem or leaving, I mean, approaching Jericho or leaving Jericho, there's at least three possible answers. I don't know which is the right one. What the city known as Jericho in Jesus' day is not built upon the site of historic Jericho. Historic Jericho is nearby. It's close enough nearby that the city took the name. So it's possible that he's leaving the city of Jericho but approaching classic Old Testament Jericho. That's possible. It's also possible to translate the Greek um, as Jesus was in the nearer Jericho, meaning the vicinity of Jericho. That's, that's the other possibility. It's also possible, some have suggested, that Jesus was passing by Jericho and turned around and at this guy's call went back, and actually that's the reason he stays in Jericho and ends up meeting Zacchaeus. That's possible as well. I don't know which of those answers is right, but there's at least three viable options for why that's the case. But that's, that's the big, oh, conflicts in the Bible. There's two and there's one. Oh, you know, like, that one I never really understood because you can tell a story. Yeah, we, we met a guy... Well, there were three guys. Yeah, I know, but the guy who talked, we, we met a guy, you know, that's accurate. But, but yeah, that's one of the big, oh, gotcha Bible conflicts that isn't really that big of a deal. But um, yeah, I, I don't know which of those solutions is right, but it's, it's not, to my mind, a big deal. But 
good, good question. Anyone thoughts? Good question. Moving on, other questions, other thoughts? Lee, what? <laughs> well, that's, that's even another option. Um, for those driving somewhere, maybe Omaha, um, Lee uh, suggested that sometimes you can call the greater region by the name. In our area, Prole is really a speck on the map, but Prole, I was in Prole, it could refer to any area in 20 square miles. Um, we're in Prole, yeah, we're in churches in Prole. That, that's possible as well. Uh, that, that's also entirely possible. Okay, next. Wanda Cowan. Well, I wasn't gonna bring this up because it's kind of like the angel thing, but Dan kind of <laughs> led me into this. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I've had, <coughs> Dan did. <laughs> I've had three people recently, um, two are not believers and one is a goes to church on and off, yeah. and they, they don't believe in the Bible. That's not true. It's fairy tales. Okay. And I, I don't know how you, I'm just like, I got nothing then. Mm. Um, I just didn't know, what, what, do you, what do you say to that? I'd probably, I, I'd encourage the follow-up would be, Really, how, I'm, I'm really curious, how did you come to that conclusion? Because what you're trying to figure out is this person repeating a part, usually the people who say that have done no research, don't know anything they're talking about, and they're just sort of, everyone knows that, you know. In which case, you can then see if they're actually open to hearing anything. Sometimes people say that as a way of shutting you up, and what they really mean is stop talking. In which case, stop throwing your pearls before swine, go talk to somebody else. Um, if, if they actually are open, if they say, well, you know, everyone knows that, then, well, can I, can I help explain some of the reason why I don't think that's the case? See what they say. Um, if they've actually done some research, they might actually give you an answer. But what you hear most often, oh, it's got all these corruptions, it's got all these errors. And if that's the case, I can quickly point you to, I'll try to recite from the top of my head some of this stuff, but I can point some real resources. But um, if you go back to actually the... Um, we did a series on the inerrancy of scripture. You can look, go to our church website and go to our sermon archive, the series and the authority and the biblical authority and inerrancy. Um, I think Jeb's message might even be the best one on that for, for this point. But to give you some comparison, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of misnomers people make. They want to talk about empiricism and science. You don't use empiricism in science with history. Because right? science deals with what's, ver what's um, visual, observable, repeatable and verifiable, right? You can't observe George Washington. He's not going to repeat, right? So you don't use the scientific method with history. There's a whole different approach when it comes to history. And most people don't realize that, like we take the, the, the works of Plato, and, and people don't argue that this is all made up stuff. We've got like 10 copies of Plato. And our oldest copies are 900 years or more after Plato. Okay. Caesar's Gallic Wars, I believe, are four copies. And so these are ancient documents that nobody challenges that are accepted. And so you, you like, just get a list of like the top most attested to ancient documents. One other document, I think, is like 105. Within, by the time you get to fifth place, you're in single digits. The Bible has over 5,000 Greek New Testament or portions of the New Testament. And by comparison, we've got texts like Papyri 52 that date to about 120 A.D. Now, Jesus was crucified in 30, 33 A.D., and the gospel was written probably 60 or 70 A.D. So the original was written 70, 75 A.D. John might have even been written a little later, like 80. And we've got a copy of John from 120. That's like ridiculous. And we've got 6,000 of these things, roughly, just, just under 6,000. And so anyone who looks at the manuscript evidence, I mean, forget whether the Bible's true or not. The first question you've got to do is, can we credibly recreate what was written? Because that's the first challenge, is can we, is there any reason to believe that what we've got is what was written? And the answer to that, from any, any remotely honest 
perspective is, yes, of course, duh. No one challenges Plato, Aristotle, Herodotus, Josephus, these guys. And we've got like a dozen of their copies of their things. And they're 900 years between when they were written or more and when we've got our copies. The manuscript evidence in the New Testament is, I'll give you an example of just how, how accurate. The, the, so three, at least now, three different committees and groups have taken the Greek manuscript evidence and tried to put together a Greek New Testament. Because what you'll do is you'll compare them, and even though we don't have one magic glow-in-the-dark copy that we use, you compare them, and so say you've got 6,000 manuscripts, and 5,000 of them say reading A. And usually the differences in text are things like titles, Lord Jesus, Christ Jesus, God, God Almighty. And so say out of 6,000 manuscripts, 5,000 say Lord Jesus, and 300 say Christ Jesus, and 600 say, Lord Christ Jesus. If that's not a hard decision to make, 5,300, whatever. Um, and so what they do is they compare the manuscripts. So the example I'd use is if, if I was talking and I slowed down, and every one of you, that would be key, but every one of you uh, was trying to take a word-for-word -word copy of what I said for, say, the next 10 minutes. It is entirely, entirely possible that not one of you would get a perfect manuscript but it is entirely possible that if we collected them all, we could recreate a perfect manuscript because you wouldn't all make the same errors in the same spots. That said, two different committees, the Nestle-Lalande Committee in the 28th edition of the Greek New Testament and the United Bible Societies, the UBS, United Bible Societies, fourth edition, two separate committees working together in tandem came up with identical Greek New Testaments. That, again, is preposterous. I mean, it's ridiculous. Two separate groups of scholars and committees working independently, judging, comparing the manuscripts, came up with identical Greek New Testament. That's the level of precision. So, so the first issue of, has it been lost? Has it been corrupted by scribes? Any, the, the, part of the problem is most people you talk to have no understanding of this. They don't have categories for this, which is why the real first question you want to ask is, do you really want to discuss this, or are you trying to shut me up? But... As regards to manuscript evidence, it's ridiculous. It's not even, I mean, it's absurd how much manuscript evidence we have for the New Testament. It's, it's amazing. So that's the first question, right? Th then the next question, when you know, oh, it's fairy tales, why? Usually that comes from an anti-supernatural bias because the Bible records miracles, okay? If that's the issue, if you've got somebody who will grant, oh, yeah, you've got a pretty accurate, credible representation of what was written, but they wrote fairy tales. That's when I want to ask questions like, why would 12 men die for a fairy tale separately in over a decade or two? What, what, what would lead them to do that? It's not like they, it's not like they all bunkered down together like in, in um, um, Jonestown. You know, they, they encouraged each other and they went down in a blaze of glory. These guys, one by one, got picked off ignom poor. They didn't make money off of this. They weren't rich flying around in Lear jets, right? And every single one of them, except for John, was martyred, some of them horrifically. Peter was, according to church history, crucified upside down next to his wife and daughter. Okay? Like, what's in it for them? And, and they have to know whether or not they saw Jesus alive. It's not, you can't argue, well, they believed this wonderful story. No, because the whole reason they're crucified and killed was because they insisted Jesus rose from the dead. They could not be deceived on that point. They're either eyewitnesses or they're not, right? So what possible psychological rationale can you give for this? And again, what we're bringing forward is evidence, witness, testimony, evidence. Which again, it's not scientific and empirical, but you don't do that with history. You do do that in courts of law, trying to establish what happened. So, so witness, eyewitness evidence. And there's a whole another stream um, I could go down. Um, a guy named Peter Williams has this. I'll, I'll post this today. It's fascinating. I've talked to you when we introduced Luke two and a half years ago, the accuracy of Luke. And the question is simply, do the biblical writers evidence they know what they're talking about? And this guy's studying things like names. I made a little, actually, allusion to it today. They said Jesus of Nazareth is coming, because that's a common name. And so you have to, the, the term we use is disambiguate, right? You can't just say Jesus, because there's tons of Jesus. In Acts, there's Jesus, um, Bar, there's Simon Bar-Jesus. And so Jesus is really the Hebrew Yeshua or Joshua. It's a common enough name. And so one of these guys took a study. We found uh, 
4,000 or so ossuaries, which are bone boxes. Jewish burial practice was two-step. You put them in a tomb, the flesh decays. You come back a year later, you gather the bones, you put them in a box, you bury the bone boxes called an ossuary. And they've discovered uh, about 4,000 ossuaries from Jesus' time period. And one of the things we're able to do now is check the names. What's the frequency of the names? This is the type of thing you would not be able to do in the Old Testament, I mean, in, in the, in the uh, New Testament times. And what we find is, Whenever they're dealing with common names in the Gospels, they disambiguate. And whenever they're dealing with uncommon names, they don't. They don't need to say who um, Zacchaeus is the son of. Zacchaeus is not a common name. You can just say Zacchaeus. But Simon, Barjona, you do have to add whose son he is because it's not a common name. And these are subtle little things that either this is the most brilliant forgery or the people who wrote this are eyewitnesses. Yeah, Peter Williams, evidence that the Gospels were written as eyewitness accounts. He's not even arguing it's inerrant. He's just arguing that the attempt to say this was written hundreds of years later by, by zealous fanatics is, is silly. I mean, I'll give you an example. Suppose you're going to write a novel or a story about 17th century France. What are you going to call your people? You know, some jocks, you'll have some Pierres. Now what? The name, I mean, he just goes through with the names. They get the names right. They get the places right. We've, through archaeology, discovered in the Roman world, they would let the conquered people keep their form of government as long as Rome gets put on top. Consequently, the rulers of different regions have radically different names. It's not uniform through those proconsuls, there's governors, there's tetrarchs, there's magistrates. And Luke, again and again through Acts, nails them. Again, not proof that it's inerrant, proof that it's an eyewitness. And so now if we've got credible eyewitness testimony, what are they testifying to? They're testifying to the resurrection of Jesus, which is the final place I'd zoom in on, is some people met Jesus, and they were radically changed by it, and they went to torturous death for it, and they give their eyewitness account of it. I find it credible. What do you think of it? At this point, the person you're talking to is probably far behind, but the, the, like, they, they probably weren't ready for this type of an answer, but... To rein it in, sorry, this is a topic I'm excited about because God has so testified to his word, so testified to his word. It's, it's just ridiculous. Um, in short, I'd ask them why they think that. Have they ever read it? You know what I mean? I'd ask them that. I'd ask them if they'd be willing to read it or if they are interested, if they'd be willing to check something out. Um, I, I wouldn't be a jerk. We've got a six-part series, Biblical Authority and Inerrancy, and part of what we do in that series is deal precise. The first message, why do we believe the Bible is the Word of God? And that's the second message. The first one is the God who talks. Why believe the Bible is the Word of God? Um, then there's one about evidences for the Bible. It's, it's a, I think, a good series, and uh, you can check that out. There's lots of resources. I'll be happy if your friend is on the hook and actually interested. I got books. And I do nothing but give people books. There's some people who can testify to that. So if this is somebody who actually is interested... There's resources. Odds are they're probably not, but the simple question, really, how'd you learn that? How'd you come to that opinion? And just try to figure out if they've actually know what they're talking about or not. Um, the other question that I probably should know the answer to this, I know God drops the scales from your eyes, but if you, the power is in the word. So mm -hmm. if you say to them, read the Bible, yeah. if they think it's a fairy yeah. tale, like our niece, I was yeah. like, when Glenn and I were, were like, doing our morning study, we're like, well, if you think it's a fairy tale, it does kind of read like a fairy tale, you know? Yeah. But we know it's not. Right. So telling somebody, read it, I know God has to work in their life, but yeah. is there just power in reading it, Jeremy? Absolutely. So that, okay, because I thought maybe God had to drop the scales right. and... No, but, no, but so take the, that dropping scales metaphor. There's a number of metaphors. Dropping the scales, removing the veil, eyes that see ears that hear, taking a heart of stone, giving a heart of flesh. But another metaphor for all the same thing is being born again, right? So Jesus says in John 3, you cannot be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You won't be able to see the kingdom in front of you if you're not born again. And there in John 3, Jesus credits the spirit with a new birth. But in James and 1 Peter, the word is credited with the new birth. Knowing, Peter, that you were not born again, that you were not birthed, um, by perishable things, but by the living and abiding word of God. James, by his own will, he birthed us, brought us forth. That's the verb for birthing. Um, it's a kind of first use, by the word of truth. So the New Testament attributes the new birth as a work of the Spirit and a work of the word, by which I take it to mean 
The new birth is caused when the Spirit applies the Word. Now, I have no control over what the Spirit does. Jesus makes that point clear. The wind blows where it wishes. I do have ability to scatter seed. So get them in the Word. Get them in the Word. Get them in the Word. Because now you've got half of that equation. You're giving the Spirit ammo to work with and use. That's our part. Get them in the Word. We throw the seed out and God makes it grow. The Spirit comes and makes it grow. But absolutely, get them in the Word. I mean, the best thing you can do is, I'd love you to read it and tell me what you think, really. I mean, is this, is this this conclusion you came to after reading it in study? Have you ever actually sat down and read it? Because there's a lot of people who've read it and don't think it's fairy tales. And I'd love to know what you think. And try to get that precise through it. Get them in the Word. I mean, all those complicated answers I got are cute. It's nice to know that our, our faith is reasonable, but at the end of the day, it's the work of the Spirit and the Word. No one's going to become a Christian because of names. <laughs> you know what I mean? Those are very encouraging for people who have faith. And it's a way to answer mockers and scoffers, but it's not going to convert anybody. You're absolutely right. Get them in the Word. Well, okay. well said. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, Linda. Okay, <clears throat> so going back to Matthew one twenty one, so we're talking about, like you said, the name Jesus. Okay, and so that says she will give birth to a son, and you are to give in the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Yep. And then in twenty three, it says the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So was there's, I mean, I. I knew that there were other people named Jesus at that time, but I guess I never really thought about it too much until you said that now. But was there something different? Or, I mean, if he's telling them to give a name that really doesn't stand out because there are other people with that name, is that maybe part of the reason why people didn't think too much of him because that his name wasn't really, you know, like a, a name no one had ever heard before. P possibly, but I mean, his name means God saves or salvation is from God. And it, it's common for people to get multiple names. I mean, Jesus renames Peter. I mean, so Jesus picks up a lot of titles. Um, but no, the name is a common Jewish name. Joshua, from what we can tell, is common. Um, it means Yahweh saves, uh, and uh, it's the name in and of itself isn't. I mean, and I've met some people that really get hung up are we pronouncing it properly? And like, no, you're not. Um, if you were, if you were to try to approximate the Hebrew, it'd be like Yeshua or something right. like that. The point isn't the vocalization. It's, it's not the point. Um, the, it's who he is. It's what his name, who his name represents. So it's not a magic name. Um, it's not like an incantation that you got to get just right. Um, I remember growing up, Mom, we'd sing Latin, Iesus. That's Greek. If you want to say his name in Greek, it'd be Iesus. Um, and uh, so it's, it's who he is. I mean, it's like this notion that if you, if you, at the name of Jesus, confess that Jesus is Lord, well, if you think Jesus is just a good teacher, but he's Lord, you're not going to get saved. It's the, you got to fill in the person behind the name. And so... No, I don't think there's anything remarkable. It's completely fitting that his name is Joshua, Jesus God right. saves. But no, that is not in and of itself a remarkable name. Completely fitting, but it doesn't stand out. It doesn't jump out at you. Um, which It's the titles he affixes to himself that, that start jumping out. Son of man, when you realize he means the son of man from Daniel. Son of David, Messiah, right? Th those are the titles that get affixed. But it's also part of the reason why in the New Testament, Paul does not call him Jesus. Right? I had a professor, McDougall, used to say this. Um, you know that song, My Jesus, I Love? He's like, he had this weird, like, Canadian Scottish accent. It was weird. And he'd just say, you can sing that song, but I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul would never sing that song. He would never call him Jesus. He would call him Lord Jesus Christ. In Philipp Check this in Philippians. Every occurrence of Jesus in Philippians has a title, except one. Oh, and it's, oh, it's emphatic. 
in Philippians 2. Therefore God has given him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus absent any other title. That's the whole point. The name is so high and so exalted, it doesn't require title. Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They've got the Christ back now. To the glory of God the Father. Paul is always affixing titles to Jesus' name. Always. Um, he, you can call him Jesus in the Gospels. He's the glorified risen Lord, and Paul is never comfortable calling him Jesus. I'm not saying you can't. I'll do the McDougal. If you can do it, that's great for you, but if you're trying to follow the pattern of the New Testament, he's been glorified. He's been exalted. He's the Lord. And at every opportunity, Paul and Peter and James, they, they don't just call him Jesus. He's the Lord, the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. They're affixing titles left, right, and center to him. Um, so that's part of how they deal with it. Because you're right, it's a common enough name. Is that, answer, is that going you're going, or are you going somewhere else? Yeah, okay. So then go to, so the, to the Philippians mm -hmm. 2 uh, that you were talking about. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Really, is it saying, because um, I'm sure you've probably heard this, but Dr. MacArthur teaches that... Oh, dear. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, I'm just... I, I'm I not... yield. Revoco. No, no, Revoco. no. No. But he s was saying that, that the name, it's not Jesus, it's the name Lord that they're bowing to. See what I'm saying? Like he says, the name that's given above every name, that at the name of Jesus, and when he gets to that part, he says, it's not Jesus, it's the name of Jesus, which is Lord, is what it, everyone will bow to. Yes, they're calling him Lord. I think the notion is kind of like after somebody with a common enough name becomes great, the name is taken off the table for common use. It's still illegal in France to name your dog Napoleon. <laughs> it is. No, it is. Just like certain names drop out. I mean, you don't have many Judases, do you? Jezebels? Ahabs? And certain names drop out. And after Jesus comes, right, and unless you're Spanish and you're Jesus, um, you, you don't call people Jesus anymore. That's the name that's dropped out. The name has been holified. It's been sanctified. It's been set apart. For, and the concept is this. I, I picture it like this. Um, this is a terrible analogy, but it's the best one I can think of. You, you ever see like World War II movies? And I'll try to switch it around. But it's the notion of when, when, when the, I'm just thinking of someone like Hitler walks in a building and someone says, it! And they just hear the name and everyone jumps to attention. At the name of Jesus, everyone jumps, Jesus is Lord. There's the confession that comes from every lip. But the point is, is he's been so exalted that the simple name of Jesus you hear the name, what happens to every tongue in heaven, on earth, and under the earth? They make this confession, fealty, that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord. I should not do a hile there, sorry. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the picture. They hear that the name of Jesus, all creation confesses Jesus Christ is Lord. But what triggers that confession is just the name of Jesus. That's, I think, what he says, right? So, so the name, of, at the name of Jesus... Every tongue would confess, whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, so you're right. The confession is he is Lord. And, and that's the position that he has. He's God. But he's been so exalted that after the cross, at the mere mention of his name, there will come a time where it won't be a common name. In the kingdom, there will not be a lot of Jesuses running around. Right. I'm but. pretty sure it's, to, it's like, you know, when you retire a number, another sports thing there, right? Yeah, I got it. Um, <laughs> after the incarnation, it's like Jesus as a name is retired from, from public use. Um, because they wouldn't be bowing to every single Jesus that there was at that. So no, it's no, because no, he's, no. because all the, all the other Jesus names didn't right. mean Emmanuel. Right, no. And they aren't the son of man, and they aren't the son of God, and they aren't the son of David, and they're not the Lord. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Okay. Who? Bridget. So when I was in um, Spanish class in high school, we would pick names that the teacher would call us by, and Jesus was one of them. 
I think there was a kid in my class who picked that. But I guess it's a common yeah. name in, yeah. yeah. So. I always feel weird when I see the name tag because it's spelt Jesus, you know. But in theory, if someone's not doing it intentionally, blasphemously, it's just a name. It's just a vocalization. You know, you and I, because we sanctify that name, because that name means something to us, are going to struggle calling someone other than Jesus, Jesus. But there's nothing fundamentally wicked about it. It certainly could be done in a thumbing-your-nose type of way. But, you know, there you go. Yeah. Or, or Harry. Right? Isn't it Jesus H? Okay. Um, okay, we've hit a new low. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, be, but my point is I wouldn't be indignant at any Jesus you meet. He didn't pick his name. And actually, a lot of that's done in, in Latin culture. They name just what everybody after saints and people in the Bible and stuff. So, um, you know, there's no command to take Jesus off the table. It's just something that seems to have been done in reverence. So, yeah. Mike. I'm going to take you back a little bit to your history teaching you were mm. doing a minute ago. I think one of the biggest miracles of the Bible is the way that it spread and got rewritten millions of times in, to different yeah. continents, and that yet when you pull them back together from different continents, they still match. Yeah. How... How soon and how did the Bible spread to all these other continents? It's a good, it's a good question. Um, as far as we can tell, the earliest New Testament writing is probably Galatians. Galatians was almost certainly written um, bef- no, I'm trying to think before or after before Acts, the events of Acts 15, because because at Acts 15 there's a whole church council. Peter, James, John, Paul get together to decide the issue of Gentile circumcision. And they actually write a missive, they write a letter that they spread out. And it really is inconceivable that Paul could be aware of that, argue as forcefully as he does in Galatians and not reference it, because Paul's dealing with the exact same issue in Galatians. So just what everyone agrees, Galatians is pre-Acts 15, because Paul doesn't reference it. So Galatians is almost certainly the earliest writing, and that probably came out within 10 or 15 years after the cross. Um, one of the other arguments you'll hear about the Bible is he didn't have a Bible, until a Roman Catholic Council, Constantinople in 411, 413, something like that. That's Bosch as well. One of, one of, somehow, and we don't know how, Mike, we don't know how, Jesus predicted, my sheep hear my voice, and he predicted in, in John 14, 15, and 16, that the Spirit would come, he'd bring to remembrance the things that he said, and that that's setting in motion the concept that disciples are going to write. What is fascinating, though, if you turn to 1 Timothy 5, And this ties in even with what you were saying, Wanda. Um, I, I think, and, and John Piper recently wrote a book that I think is phenomenal. It's called uh, Peculiar Glory. And it's about the self-authenticating witness of the Bible to itself. The Bible testifies to its own authority in part by its glory. Um, and somehow the early church recognized the writings of Paul and Peter and James as scripture. And here's evidence for that. This is remarkable, okay? So Paul was a Pharisee. He probably memorized most, if not all, of the Old Testament. And in chapter 5, this is actually part of the basis for why we dedicated an issue of the messenger to Dave Martin. We've done that previously with Jeb Brewer. Because Paul says, let the elders who rule well be worthy of double honor. It's good to honor faithful leaders in the right way. You can, you can honor leaders in an idolatrous way, but showing honor to a good servant is good. Verse 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, he's going to make two quotes with a single introduction. Now, there can be no doubt in your mind what you think Paul is, what Paul thinks he's doing when he introduces a quote with the scripture says, and first he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 15, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads the grain. Then, and the laborer deserves his wages. What possible scripture is he quoting there? Why is he quoting Luke 10, 7? 
And you can't play that off as oral reports. Because he doesn't say it is said, it is written. So let's, let's formulate some correlatives, some things that have to be true. So consequently, if Paul can quote Luke, Luke's written at this point. So that throws out the window, Luke was written in the third century in Egypt by a bunch of, you know, um, whatever. No, Luke has to be written for Paul to quote Luke. Second, Paul thinks Luke's scripture. Third, Paul thinks Timothy thinks Luke's scripture because he offers no apologetic or defense. It's assumed. Does not look like, he does not anticipate this as a controversial statement. Fourth, Luke is... He assumes is scripture. He assumes Timothy thinks Luke is scripture. He assumes Timothy is so familiar with Luke, he can quote half a phrase. You guys probably didn't know that was Luke. He expects Timothy to know it's Luke. Fifth, go to the end of 1 Timothy, verse 20 of chapter 6. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you, and the you there is plural. Now he's addressing the whole church. So six, Pete Paul assumes the entire church at Ephesus thinks Luke's scripture. Now, I don't know how they came to that conclusion. I just know they did. And Jesus in John says, John 10 says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So somehow, the Holy Spirit testified that the Gospel of Luke was Scripture on a par with the book of Deuteronomy, which is part of the law written by Moses. So I don't know how it was done, but we have evidence right here that it was done. And so what we see from the manuscript evidence is, and even, I'll give you one other thing, Wanda. The early church fathers, just, I, I have a 22-volume set my wife got me for our second anniversary. That's how... She gets me. That's how romantic she is. 22-set volume of everything laid down by the early church fathers in the first four centuries. Everything. And according to Bruce Metzger, we could recreate 95% of the New Testament by their citations alone. So, the people of Jesus understood something special was happening with the New Testament writings, and across the board, whether they're people in Egypt, Africa, Asia, Europe, they're quoting it like the Old Testament with the Old Testament. So how they came to those conclusions, I don't know. They did. It's evident. It's easily demonstrable that this wasn't something that foisted on the church years later. Uh, Clement, who um, Clement is one of the earliest, he's quoting 1 Corinthians. And in Clement's writing in the early 2nd century, I mean, realize the canon closed around 90 A.D. Revelation is the last book of the New Testament written around 90 A.D. And Clement's writing in the early 2nd century, quoting 1 Corinthians. So those people don't want to argue there's this big gap for like these King Arthur-like legends. To, there is no gap. There's not enough space. Um, there's simply not enough space. In fact, Bruce Metzger, who's part of a, a committee, a, a group trying to find old, old, old Greek New Testaments, is working on one right now, a Gospel of Mark that in its first couple of sets of datings come back at 70 AD. That is absolutely crazy. I mean, just, <laughs> I mean, that is within decades. One or two or three decades of when it was written. You don't have, you, eyewitnesses are still alive. So you can't make up these legends. In fact, go to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul appeals to eyewitnesses. First Corinthians fifteen three. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Paul is inviting verification right there. And our documents indicate this thing was written back then, and this is an awfully big bluff to make, if, if you're bluffing. And so most of, I mean, it was popular in the early 20th century, especially with a bunch of uh, the, the neo-orthodoxy coming out of Germany and stuff to, to say that all the Gospels were written in the 4th century by Gnostics and 
Alexandria and in Egypt. And the new text discoveries, just, you can just throw that out the window. You can't have it written in the 4th century when we've got copies that come from 120 AD. It doesn't work. So wherever the Christians went, they brought the writings with them, whatever they had. They quoted them. You can demonstrate that. You can, you can just show the early church fathers quoting the New Testament alongside of the Old Testament. And they don't quote the Apocrypha, and they don't quote the other writings, the Pseudepigrapha, or any of those things. They're quoting the New Testament. In fact, Eusebius, I think Eusebius is late 3rd century, so 200-something, like 270. Eusebius actually has a list of, of the books accepted in the canon that matches what they came up with in, in, in Constantinople. So what hap- just to explain what took place in, in the 4th century, once Constantine legalized Christianity, the church could come out of hiding. And one of the first things the church wanted to do was have an ecumenical council to get everyone on the same page. So basically it was like, hey, if you think you've, got, we know that God's been writing some new scripture, we've got some of it, maybe your church had the gospel of Luke and, you know, 1 Corinthians. If you think you, let's come together. And one of the things they wanted to hammer out was that. And that's where the, the list of accepted books came from. Constantinople did not authorize the New Testament, it recognized the New Testament. And it, Clearly, by quoting Luke, somehow the early church understood. So this is a long-winded answer. I apologize for your, your question, but the, the New Testament spread with the early church. It is early. We can't get back to a date before that. We, it's anywhere we're going, any of the writings we have, they're quoting it. There isn't like it suddenly shows up in the fourth century. Um, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Didache, the earliest writings, it's there. They're quoting it. Um, so... The, the church recognized what God was doing, and they brought it and spread it with them. And they translated it into other languages. Before you get out of the, the second or third, you've got it into Syriac, into Latin, into Coptic. I mean, it's just, they're taking it, the message with them, and it's spreading with them like wildfire. And people are dying, and people are getting persecuted, because until the fourth century, to be a Christian was to take on an eventual death sentence in many places. So again, back to Juana's question, what's the motivation? Are they getting rich? Are they getting notoriety? Are they getting persecuted? Um, what's the ration, What's the explanation while eyewitnesses are still alive? Um, so, anyway. Oh, I just posted, I just saw this this morning on Facebook, another one of these cool things. Um, uh, and again, more and more of this dead German neoliberalism. It's not just Germans, sorry, Marina. But it, a lot of them are, a lot of them are Germans. <laughs> not all Germans are bad, but... But um, you. you got Bonhoeffer, right? You know, yeah, you got Bonhoeffer. Okay. <laughs> but that school of thought, yeah, and, Lut- and Luther, yeah. <laughs> hey, okay. Um, um, but it was very common to think that um, this stuff, the deity of Christ, was not originally taught, and it was an innovation that came about much, much later, really formalized at the Council of Constantinople, that it wasn't until the Council of Constantinople that you're the deity of Christ. Jesus never claimed to be God. The early church didn't think he was God, yada, 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 yada. Okay, they're finally putting on view a discovery made in 2005 in Israel um, of a early church they found, and there is, a, I think, a table that was donated, and somebody wrote an inscription on the table in big... Greek majuscule letters, and the inscription reads, dedicated or given by, in the person's name, to the God Christ Jesus. Almost two centuries before the Council of Constantinople. And again, if this is a controversial statement, you're not writing it big letters on your furniture. You know what I mean? Like, again, amongst the church, this wasn't controversy. This wasn't, ooh, that's kind of, no. Again, if, if you go in and do the research, the, the, the beliefs that we hold to, there's no break. They don't show up suddenly. Paul doesn't bring them in, you know, or pseudo-Paul, because there wasn't a Paul, but the Paulian, yeah, that's all bosh. Sorry. Um, but no, but it is, but people still say it, you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it, no, it's, it's, no, it's frustrating, because most people just repeat, most people on this stuff are second-handers, meaning, 
they haven't done any research or study themselves. They're citing authorities, their professor, their person. And so it's really hard to reason with that person because it's not like you can discuss the textual evidence with them. They just know that their professor said it's fairy tales and there's corruptions and it's all sorts of errors. And so then it's really just pitting me as an authority against a professor as an authority, and that's just not going to go very far. Which is why, if that's what you're dealing with, I wouldn't argue too much. Like, well, if you're interested, I think there are answers. But um, for people who actually know, yeah, it's for people who actually can look at the data, whether or not you think the Bible is the word of God, it is the most accurately well attested to ancient document, period. Its historical accuracy is unparalleled. I mean, just without question, unparalleled. Even if you don't think it's the word of God, it is a ridiculously accurate attested to document. So, does that answer your question, Mike? Or we got one more question. Naomi, bring us home, Naomi. We got two minutes. You may have to answer this next week, but I was just wondering. Do, if it has to do with angels, Naomi. No, it does not. Okay. You're... You'll okay. be pleased to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, demons. Okay. Um. Um, so, I was wondering how do we say which books are scripture and which books are not, because you touched on it a little bit with um, them quoting each other sort of in the New Testament, mm -hmm. but there are other historical documents from that time, right. and so some people include that in the New Testament right. and some people don't, and so you might have to talk about this next week. But no, I'll give you a short answer, because I really, I know it sounds boring, a, a, a lecture by a guy named Peter Williams on names. It is fascinating. Has anyone seen Peter Williams' thing? Isn't it cool it's, and interesting? It's not boring? Trust me. This, what? He's a British guy. Those, they always got cool accents. They're always fun to listen to. But um, here's the two, two part. I'll give you a two part answer. One, you don't simply don't find the citations of the other books in the early church father. At the end of the day, the answer is Jesus' sheep hear his voice. And the people who call themselves Christians, even with the schisms and divisions that have existed in the church over other topics, have almost uni unanimously agreed on the canon. There hasn't been a ton of controversy within the church. I mean, there's going to be some weird fringe groups. Now, if you watch this video, what you'll see is he'll line up and he uses names and places as the criterion for eyewitness accounts. And he simply has a graph of how many names occur in the Gospels per verse. And you see this graph, and it's like, you know, maybe a name every eight verses. You bring in, what's the biggest wannabe Gospel? Thomas, right? That's the one everyone's throwing out, Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas. Um, how many names does Thomas have? Three. Three. That's, that's three. And, and, and then how many place names? What, God, what Thomas does is there was a man. They came to a city. There's, there's none of that information. There's none of the eyewitness evidence. that the God, And as you start showing these in some graphs, and you're just jaw-dropping when you see just the difference in kind. But the biggest thing with the Gospel of Thomas is it's not a Gospel. There's no death, burial, resurrection. Um, it's, it's not the, the Greek isn't the gospel of John. It's the gospel according to John. Kata Iohim. There's only one gospel. The gospel is the death, burial. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. So it's according to John, according to Luke, according to Matthew, according to Mark. If there's no death, burial, resurrection in the t book, whatever it is, it ain't a gospel. The Thomas is supposedly a collection of sayings with one or two childhood accounts of Jesus. And nobody quoted it in the, in the early church. No, the fathers quoted it or referenced it. And no group of people bearing the fruit of Christians have accepted it as canon. But at the end of the day, Jesus' sheep hear his voice. It sure looks like that over 2,000 years. There's been far, far, far more agreement than anything closely to disagreement. Usually the people that want to do that is they want to get provocative and the Da Vinci Code stuff comes up. But you actually look at like Christ followers, find groups of Christ followers who have a different canon. You're not going to really find that. Um, the closest attempt was Marcion in the 5th century who wanted to get rid of the Old Testament. Um, just Can't we just start over with the loving God in the New Testament? You know, the God in the Old Testament is mean, so can we just throw away the Old Testament? Marcion tried to do that. But I mean, again, we're not talking about a different... He's agreeing on the New Testament. He just doesn't like the Old Testament. You know, he's just... An, he's ahead of his time. He's a liberal ahead of his time. Um, you know, What? Oh, he did only have, oh, he kept Luke, sorry. I'm, I haven't studied Marcion enough, my bad. But I'm going to post the uh, Peter Williams thing on Facebook. You can check it out. It is truly, is, I've watched it like seven or eight times. It's fascinating, fascinating. On that note, we'll close. Um, Lord, 
We thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for how well you've testified to and preserved your word. We thank you that you have not left yourself without a witness, and you've not left man with an excuse, that you have um, revealed yourself plainly, and you've spoken clearly and have not stuttered. And we thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for giving us your spirit. We thank you most of all for giving us your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.